This is Positively Farming Media. Hello, my gardening friends, and welcome back to the Just Grow Something podcast. This week, we're digging into a topic I have been asked numerous times to cover and really couldn't because I've never grown them. With names like Puffball, Stinkhorn, Enoki, Patty Straw, Shaggy Mane, I didn't even know where to begin to research how to grow them, much less to do a deep dive into the ethnobotany of the crop. I'm talking about mushrooms. This is not going to be my typical crop-specific episode because the rabbit hole I went down made me realize the awesome complexity of what we refer to as a mushroom and all the different traditional and current uses for them. So while we'll deviate a little bit from the format today, prepare to learn everything you can possibly imagine learning about growing mushrooms in about a 40-minute time frame. And trust me, there's a lot. Let's dig in. Hey, I'm Karen, and I started gardening 18 years ago in a small corner of my suburban backyard. When we moved to a five-acre homestead, I expanded that garden to half an acre, and I found such joy and purpose in feeding my family and friends. This newfound love for digging in the dirt and providing for others prompted my husband and I to grow our small homestead into a 40-acre market farm. When I went back to school to get my degree in horticulture, I discovered there is so much power in food, and I want to share everything I've learned with as many people as possible. On this podcast, we explore crop information, soil health, pests and diseases, plant nutrition, our own nutrition, and so much more in the world of food and gardening. So grab your garden journal and a cup of coffee and get ready to just grow something. I already knew, just from my botany and horticulture studies, that what we refer to as mushrooms encompasses a very wide range of fruiting bodies that grow on the soil or on top of their own specific food source. And while the edible and medicinal versions of these are typically represented by just a handful of species, there are so many fungi that would fall into the category of mushroom. So what we'll be talking about today will be the fleshy, spore-bearing fruiting body of a fungus that has a cap, some gills, and more often than not, a stem that we typically consume either for culinary purposes or nutritional or medicinal reasons. If we were to look at the typical nutritional breakdown of a mushroom, it varies widely from species to species. On average, the mushrooms that we consume for culinary or nutritional reasons are low in calories, have no fat or cholesterol, have few carbs and some protein, and not a lot of the usual nutrients we typically see listed on nutritional labels like vitamin A and calcium. What mushrooms do pack a punch with, though, are all those micronutrients and trace elements we are often lacking in our modern diet. Things like copper, selenium, niacin, and riboflavin. And mushrooms also contain antioxidants we don't often hear about, like ergothionine. All of these micronutrients are key players in supporting our immune system. There are even mushrooms now that are UV-treated to be rich in vitamin D. Now, this is because mushrooms contain ergosterol, which which becomes vitamin D when it's exposed to UV light. So these exposed mushrooms can give you a boost of that vitamin D when you eat them. Now, as scientists and nutrition experts are now looking more closely at the benefits of eating mushrooms, like lowering blood pressure, protecting brain and heart health, and making improvements to our gut, ancient Greeks believed eating mushrooms made warriors strong. And in Chinese culture, mushrooms have long been considered a medicinal food and good for long life. Japan has already approved a mushroom-based drug to treat cancer. So the traditional uses of mushroom go back centuries, and their medicinal uses are being proven now today. Now, it is important to note that we're talking about cultivated mushrooms here. I mentioned there are thousands of species that fall into the mushroom category, and many, many of them can make us sick or worse. Never go hunting for wild mushrooms unless you have an experienced expert with you to train you on what to look for. For example, morel mushroom season is a really big deal here in Missouri. People wait with anticipation every year to go and hunt them. But there is such a thing as a false morel, and if you don't know what you're looking for, you can make yourself or someone else sick or even kill them. So be smart about your mushrooms. If we look at the typical mushrooms that we see in the grocery store, we're looking at three different types in most cases, white button, cremini or babybella, and portobello. 
And what I've discovered is that these are all exactly the same mushroom. These are all agaricus bisporus, the cultivated white button mushroom, but they're harvested at different stages of growth. So while the color and the flavor profile is slightly different and the texture changes as that mushroom ages, it's all the same species. So it's no wonder people want to know how to grow their own mushrooms at home. There are so many to choose from, and they all have such different flavors, but they're rarely found in the supermarket. Blue oyster, pink oyster, shiitake, chanterelle, the list goes on forever. And then, of course, there's lion's mane, which is especially renowned for its health benefits, specifically brain health. And then we have the psychedelic mushrooms in the psilocybin group. But before we can talk about growing mushrooms in cultivation, we have to understand their life cycle. Mushrooms are a little different in the way that they reproduce than any of our other garden plants, but there are some comparisons to be made. The part that we call a mushroom is the fruiting body of a fungal organism that is above the surface of whatever medium they're growing on, whether that's soil or a log or a substrate that we provide for them. That fruiting body is designed to produce and spread spores, which we could look at as the mushroom's seeds. If the fruit of a tomato plant is designed to hold the seeds and spread them to create new tomato plants, the mushroom body is designed to hold the spores and spread them to grow new fungal organisms. So when these spores land on a suitable surface and the conditions are just right, they will germinate just like a seed. But instead of a little baby plant popping out, the germinated spores form strand-like structures called hyphae. Multiple hyphae will join together, and that forms mycelium. Now, you may have seen mycelium in your own garden or seen pictures of it. Mycelium are this sort of white fuzzy stuff. It will entangle the roots of plants and trees and will help plants absorb water and nutrients. They can help those plant roots reach further into the soil than they can by themselves, and they'll transport nutrients to the roots. And in return, the mycelium feed on the starches the plant roots provide. This is called a mycorrhizal network. And as soon as I learned this in school, mycorrhizal fungi became my new favorite organism. It is just a really cool symbiosis between the plant and the mycorrhizae. But in terms of growing mushrooms, the mycelium is actually the largest part of the fungal organism, not the fruiting body itself. In fact, there is a honey fungus growing in the Blue Mountains in Oregon that, supported by its expanse of mycelium, occupies a space of almost four square miles, or 10 square kilometers. This makes it the largest organism in the world, and it may actually be over 8,000 years old. Of course, on a much smaller scale than that, once our fungal spores have germinated and their hyphae have joined together to form mycelium, when the time and the conditions are right, the mycelium will produce that fruiting body to start the cycle all over again. So in terms of growing mushrooms at home, this is the stage at which we collect the mushrooms to consume and possibly to collect the spores to start our growing process all over again. Now, in hearing all of this, growing mushrooms sounds pretty straightforward. Just get our hands on some spores, find something the fungus likes to grow on, inoculate that substance with the spores, give it the right conditions, and watch it grow. Unfortunately, we're talking about fungi here. And just because we want to grow one kind of fungi doesn't mean we won't have something else less desirable invade the space and try to take over. So sterile conditions matter. Growing conditions matter. And the substrate matters, depending on what kind of mushroom we want to grow. There's a lot more involved than I ever realized. So before we dig into this, I want to tell you that if you are considering growing your own mushrooms and you've never read into it before... Be prepared to feel a little overwhelmed, because I sure was. I will also suggest that you maybe start with a pre-made kit of some sort for your first go-round and see if it's something that you want to try. You can get kits that already have the mycelium ready to go, and all you have to do is slice open the plastic to expose the network to air and keep it in the correct conditions. Once you've got the hang of that, you can maybe go one step further and get a kit that contains a pre-colonized grain bag. We'll talk about that here in a minute. 
but maybe the mycelium hasn't been moved to a substrate yet. So you can go a bit deeper into the process and see if it's right for you and your setup before you go all in. There are simpler options to start with other than what we're about to talk about. That being said, let's dig into everything you need to know about growing mushrooms at home from the ground up. I will give you a minute to grab a pen and a paper and settle in because there is a lot of information here. I'll be right back. It's time to get moving on the gardening season and the folks at Elm Dirt have us covered. From potting mix to worm castings, their fantastic plant juice and bloom juice, even their new kelp mist foliar spray, they've got what we gardeners need for starting and growing plants of all kinds. They've even got gift bundles for the beginning gardener or the plant lover in your life. Listeners of this podcast get a free bottle of bloom juice with any purchase from Elm Dirt. So head to justgrowsomethingpodcast.com slash dirt and use code justgrow at checkout for your free bottle. The link is in the show notes. I am going to link to a ton of resources for you for this episode so you can find all this information because there is a lot to understand and I can't possibly cover all of it here. Now, if you are on my email list, you already are getting the show notes emailed to you every week and those resources are listed there. If you're not on my email list, head to justgrowsomethingpodcast.com and go to the bottom to sign up for the newsletter. And if you have signed up at one point or like you entered your email address to get a download before, but you aren't getting the newsletters and the show notes, be sure to check your spam or your junk folders and add grow at justgrowsomethingpodcast.com to your whitelist, especially if you are using Outlook. I just had to do this in my Outlook in order to receive emails from my local chamber of commerce because they were ending up somewhere other than my junk folder even, like not even getting through. They were out there in the cyber spear spot somewhere. So get on the email list and I will send you the show notes every week when the new Tuesday episodes are published. Otherwise, the show resources are always listed in the episode note, uh, show notes on my website. All right, let's start with growing conditions. Mushrooms prefer humidity, so it's going to be necessary to create some sort of an enclosed environment to keep them happy. This is known as a fruiting chamber. What you use as a fruiting chamber will depend on what type of mushrooms you are trying to grow. Small mushrooms like oyster, reishi, and chestnuts will happily grow in plastic storage tubs. This is referred to as the monotub method. Larger species, though, tend to grow out of large plastic grow bags, sometimes referred to as unicorn bags. Um, these bags have to be kept in a controlled environment. So this is where something like a mini greenhouse or a grow tent comes into play. The growers I've spoken to mostly started with small grow tents when they stepped up their growing game because the inside conditions can be very closely regulated. Now, remember I said that we're growing fungi here, and there could be competition. Mycelium is prone to contamination as it grows. The conditions it prefers are also the perfect environment for mold and bacteria. So in everything I've read and everyone I've talked to, it has been stressed. Cleanliness and sterility are critical throughout the entire growing process. So it may be a good idea to set up your growing area someplace that it's not going to be disturbed too often, and you can keep it very clean. Now, once the mycelium has colonated whatever substrate you choose, and we'll talk about that in a minute, fresh air and light are what trigger the fruiting. So ambient light is perfectly fine. It doesn't need to be particularly bright light. But if you end up using a grow tent or some other fruiting chamber that doesn't get natural daylight, then you may need to use a grow light of some sort. So let's do a quick rundown of all the supplies that you will need um, if you plan to grow your own mushrooms from start to finish without the use of a pre-colonized grain bag or a kit. So if you do start with a grain bag, some of this won't be necessary and I will talk about that. So what you really need is mushroom spores, either in a print, a swab, or a syringe from a very reputable uh, source, or a pre-colonized grain bag. You'll need a still air box, yeah, I know. It sounds complicated already. We'll get there in a minute. Um, isopropyl alcohol at 70%, paper towels and disposable gloves, preferably a face mask. And then if you're not using those pre-colonized grain bags, you will also need agar plates, 
uh, a scalpel or a craft knife, grain of some sort, rye, wheat, millet, any of those, a pressure cooker. Yeah, that one surprised me too. Um, And then you're going to need mason jars and lids or the mushroom grow bags, depending on what type of system you're going to set up, an incubation chamber, a fruiting chamber, something to use as a growing substrate. So this is often wood pellets or cocoa coir, sawdust, um, coffee grounds. You'll need a spray bottle for misting. And then depending on the type of mushroom that you're growing, you may need a seedling heat mat with a thermostat. Yeah, it sounds like a long list. Let's go through the growing process sort of step by step, and then we'll figure out what all these things are being used for. Now, I'm going to take you on a very high-level overview of the growing process. This process can vary significantly depending on the species that you're trying to grow. I'm just trying to give you a general overview because, again, I've not grown mushrooms like this, and there are a lot of variables. I think the overview will give you a good idea of what all is involved, though, and if you decide to move forward, you'll have a direction to go when doing your own research to learn the specifics of growing whatever variety it is that you want to grow. So if you're growing mushrooms using a pre-colonized grain bag, you can skip all of these first steps. I'll let you know where the grain bags come into play. But if you're starting from scratch, you'll start with a little construction. Professional mushroom growers use a laminar flow hood in order to create a clean work environment. It's kind of like an air filter sitting up on one end that you work in front of that cleans the air as you work, and that prevents mold and bacteria from infecting the mycelium. Now, assuming that you aren't going to invest in this expensive piece of equipment right off the bat, a still air box is what you'll be using, and you'll need to make one. Now, the still air box is where you are going to do your inoculations and your transfers. It creates a clean environment to reduce the risk of contamination while you work. The simplest way to do this is by using a clear plastic storage tub that's large enough for you to be able to have all your equipment inside and also have room to work. So basically, you can take a 17-gallon storage tote flip it upside down on its lid, create two holes in the side large enough for your hands to slide in and work, and you're done. Picture like an incubator in a neonatal intensive care unit or a clean box in a laboratory that has the gloves attached to prevent contamination. This is the same concept. You're creating a clean place to work. Once you've got your still air box and you have all of your other supplies to include your mushroom spores from wherever you got them from, the next thing to do is to inoculate the agar. And this is exactly what it sounds like. You're going to have petri dishes, otherwise known as agar plates, just like in a laboratory. And this is where you will germinate your spores. Agar is a nutrient-rich jelly-like substance and it is ideal for growing spores. That's why it's used in laboratories for growing specimens. This is where sterility is very, very important. Anything that gets on the agar, other than the spores you want to grow, are going to try and grow right alongside your hyphae. So you should be using gloves and even a face mask at this point. You need to be disinfecting the inside of your still air box and your work surface with that isopropyl alcohol, disinfecting the scissors, the scalpel handle, all of it. Then disinfect the outside of your agar plates, but leave them closed and put all of your disinfectant items inside your still air box. Inside that box, open the spore, whether it's the print, the swab, or the syringe, whatever you ordered from your reputable supplier of mushroom spawn, and then carefully take the lid off of the agar plate. If you're using a spore print, you're going to use that scalpel blade to scrape a few spores onto the agar. If you're using a spore swab, you're going to swipe it across the agar. And then if you're using a spore syringe, you're going to squeeze a couple of drops out onto the agar. Keep that agar open for as little time as possible before closing it up again. And now it's time to incubate. So write down the date that you inoculated the agar for reference and move the plates from the still air box to your incubation chamber. Now this sounds like a big deal, but really this could just be inside of a storage box or an unused cupboard or on a shelf somewhere out of the way with minimal disturbances. 
Now, depending on the type of mushroom you decide to grow, you may have to maintain a specific temperature for germinating the spore. So if this is the case, then you're going to use a seedling heat mat, preferably with a thermostat, to keep the mycelium within this optimal range. A lot of us gardeners who start our own seeds already have these. The precise temperature needed is going to depend on the type of mushroom. So this is something that you want to research before you start the process. Check your plates every few days to see whether or not the hyphae has started to form and whether it's forming a mycelium. And here is where you watch for contamination. Healthy mycelium is white. If you see any green, blue, brown, pink, black, orange, or patches of any color other than white, then you likely have contamination. And trust me, I've seen it in person or I've seen it through video and it's very obvious which is the healthy mycelium and which is the other stuff that we don't want. Now, if a plate gets contaminated, but it also has healthy mycelium growing next to it, you can transfer the healthy stuff to another agar plate. So thankfully, the whole thing isn't a waste at that point. You just want to do that, once again, in your still air box and do all of those procedures all over again to make that transfer. Now, once you've got healthy mycelium, now you have to make your grain spawn. Healthy mycelium is going to want to eat, and once it has used up all the nutrients that are in the agar, it's going to need something else to feed on. This is where that grain comes in. You can use cereal grains like rye, wheat, or millet. Um, you can use popcorn, wild bird seed, even a vermiculite and brown rice combo. Each of these options has its pros and cons. You'll have to research which is the preferred food for what you're growing and how you're growing it. Now, once you have your grain of choice, you'll have to wash it, soak it, simmer it, and then it needs to be sterilized. And this is where that pressure cooker comes into play. Um, this is going to be done in either the mason jars that you're going to put into your monotub or the unicorn bags that you'll be putting into your grow tent or your greenhouse. And I have seen where you can sterilize grain jars in like a regular pan if you don't have a pressure cooker, but it all needs to be sterile before you use it as a food for your mycelium. Now, this step can be skipped if you purchase pre-sterilized grain bags at the same time that you order your spawn. You're putting your trust in the supplier that the sterilization has been done properly and there's no contamination though, so buyer beware. Now, the next step is to inoculate the grains. Once the grains have cooled, you need to inoculate them. You're going to take that healthy mycelium that you cultured on your agar, and then you're going to add this to the sterile grain. Now, if you ordered your spawn in a syringe, I read that you can also skip the whole agar plate step and just inoculate the grains directly, but you just have to be sure that the syringe is not contaminated. So at that point, you may want to wipe down the syringe with that isopropyl alcohol before you decide to use it. So you're going to disinfect your still air box and equipment all the same as you did before, wipe down the jars or the grow bags that you're going to be using too, and put everything into your still air box. Open one of the colonized agar plates and cut the agar and the mycelium into small square pieces. Then you'll open your first grain jar or your bag and drop in the agar piece with the mycelium. Shake the jar or the bag around to give it some more inoculation points and then move on to the next jar or bag. So you have now inoculated that grain. It's up to you how much agar to put into each container. If you only have one plate, you can split it up amongst a couple of different containers. As a rule, I guess the more agar you put into each jar or bag, the faster it's going to colonize. But if you put too much in one jar or bag, then I guess it can cause the mycelium to overheat as it grows. So this is something that needs to be practiced. And you'll have to see what works best for you and whatever fungus it is that you plan on growing. Um, the next thing is to incubate the grains. You're going to do this under the same conditions as you did with the agar when germinating the spores. Check the containers regularly for signs of contamination. If you spot anything that just doesn't look right, I guess it's best to discard the infected containers and do not open them inside your growing space because you could spread the spores that you don't want throughout the air. Now, if you order a pre-colonized grain bag, you will have skipped every step up until now. You will take your purchased grain bag and you will pick it up in the next phase. So now we are going to inoculate the substrate. 
So once the grain spawn is fully colonized, this is when it gets moved to the growing medium on which the mycelium will eventually fruit to produce mushrooms. So the substrate can vary depending on the mushroom variety. Some prefer coco coir. There's others that like straw or sawdust or wood pellets. There's people who do this on logs. There's all kinds of different substrates that you can use. Again, research is going to be on you and whatever um, mushroom it is that you're planning on growing. Now, whatever you're using before you inoculate the substrate, you need to pasteurize it. <laughs> so this is sort of similar to the sterilization process that we did in the pressure cooker, but this is a little bit faster because the mycelium have already developed some resistance to contaminants by now, and we're not really looking for pure, an actual sterilization at this point. In this step, you're just wanting to heat the substrate up to 150 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit for around two hours. You're going to hold it there. So we really are just pasteurizing and not sterilizing. So we do this basically by placing whatever substrate we're going to use into a large pan of water on the stovetop. Larger growers will do this in big kettles. However you do it, you want to monitor the temperature range. We want the beneficial bacteria to survive, but we want to destroy the potentially harmful pathogens. So pasteurize, not sterilize. Now, if you're using a monotub and mason jars, you're going to want to disinfect them at this point with the isopropyl alcohol. Otherwise, have your grow bags ready. Once the substrate is pasteurized and has cooled, we squeeze out the excess water and then we stuff it into our jars or our grow bags. And then we crumble in those inoculated grains and we mix them into the substrate. We seal up the containers, close the monotub or put your bags in their grow tent or your greenhouse. And now it's time, once again, to incubate. <laughs> We're going to incubate the substrate. This is the final incubation stage, and this should go much faster than the previous times. Depending on the species, the mycelium could colonate the substrate in as little as one to two weeks. It could be longer for certain varieties. Once you see that the substrate has become white and fluffy, this means that it is covered with the mycelium and you are ready to initiate fruiting. We are in that final stage, right? Initiate fruiting conditions. It sounds like something in a sci-fi movie. You will need to research the species that you are growing to learn their preferred fruiting conditions. But what all varieties seem to have in common is that they need fresh air and humidity to produce those mushrooms, those fruiting bodies. So you will need to open the container and mist it at regular intervals. This is also when you'll introduce some ambient light or turn on your grow light, which will tell the mushrooms which direction they're supposed to grow. And it's also going to keep them from getting all leggy or spindly. After a few days, you should see your first little pins start to form and then just watch them grow until it's finally time to harvest your mushrooms. And that is mushroom growing in a nutshell. Now, there are some of you who will have just listened to that and thought, oh, heck no. <laughs> and you may want to start with a kit that is ready for fruiting so that you just open the bag, put it in the right conditions, mist it as needed, and then harvest your mushrooms in a few weeks. Then maybe you can decide if you want to move on to having like the pre-inoculated grain bags that you transfer yourself or if you just don't want to mess with it. Now, others of you may have heard all that and thought, yeah, you want to jump in with both feet and full steam ahead. I mean, it does all sound very interesting and it would make for a mighty tasty hobby, that's for sure. So to help both camps decide, I have a special episode next week. I've got two different interviews with experienced mushroom growers, both of whom started from home, one who has already expanded into a mushroom growing enterprise and one who is just now ready to take the leap. Maybe listening to a couple of knowledgeable growers will give you a little bit more information and help you to better decide whether growing mushrooms is for you. For me, I'm going to leave it up to the pros for now and just hand them my money when I want some good mushrooms. Maybe growing them myself will be a fun hobby when I retire from farming, but probably not just yet. And of course, there is something to be said for keeping it simple and maybe straying from the norm. Despite all the warnings about sterility and choosing the proper substrate, Oliver Carlin over at Curative Mushrooms says you could also try this. 
Grab some spent coffee grounds from the coffee that you brewed that morning. Put the coffee grounds in a cup. Cut a small piece from the inside of an oyster mushroom where the spores are and put it into the coffee grounds. Stick the cup in a dark cabinet for one to two weeks, take it out, and wait another few weeks for your mushrooms to grow. Now, that's a method I could get behind. Until next time, my gardening friends, keep on cultivating that dream garden, and we'll talk again soon. You just finished another episode of the Just Grow Something podcast. For more information about today's topic, go to JustGrowSomethingPodcast.com where you can find all the episodes, show notes, articles, courses, newsletter sign up, and more. I'd also love for you to head to Facebook and join our gardening community in the Just Grow Something Gardening Friends Facebook group. So it's going to be necessary to create some sort of an enclosed environment to keep them happy. This is known as... Let's try that again... If the fruit of a tomato plant is designed to hold the seeds and spread them to create new mush uh, new mushroom plants? No, we're talking about tomatoes, Karen. Until next time, my gardening friends, keep learning and keep growing. <laughs>